got the mic on? All right, cool. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? A couple uh, quick uh, announcements GDC wanted me to make. Um, if everybody could turn off their cell phones so they don't beep during the presentation and so there's not a symphony after the presentation of emails, um, the uh, evaluation forms will be emailed out after uh, the session. So if you guys could all fill those out, uh, GDC wants to know which sessions were good. I'd also you know, like some feedback in terms of if you guys enjoyed the presentation. So if you guys could fill those out, that'd be awesome as well. So with that, let's get started. This is League of Legends, scaling to millions of summoners. A little bit about me, my name's Scott DeLapp. I'm a scalability architect at Riot. I've been with Riot since uh, 2008. Uh, how many people played uh, League of Legends in beta? We got a good mix of people. Looks like about five, ten percent. So in League of Legends time, I was at Riot about a year before beta, to kind of put some things in perspective. Um, and then uh, you've got my uh, Twitter, my Twitter handle, and my email uh, there on the slides. If anybody wants to catch up after the presentation, I'd be more than happy to talk to people. So just look me up. A little bit about Riot. So Riot was founded in September of 2006 by uh, Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill. Uh, back when I joined Riot about four years ago, I think we had about 25 or 30 employees. Uh, today we've got a little bit north of 500 with offices, the main offices in Santa Monica, California. We've got an engineering office in, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, and then we've got a uh, player support and community office in Dublin, and another one in uh, Seoul, South Korea. So our mission at Riot, every company's got to have a mission. You've got to have some sort of core theme that you're going to optimize on. Um, you know, if you've got five things, which one do you pick? And actually, I'm going to restart this because it's auto doing timings on me, which could be a bad thing. Let's see if this will work. So our mission at Riot is very simple. It's to be the most player-focused gaming company in the world. So what does that mean? Well, everything that we do at Riot is viewed through the lens of what do, you do, what do we do uh, for the players? So whether that's an engineering decision, whether that's you know, feedback from the forums, taking that into account. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, every new skin idea or something like that is instantly uh, you know, released every two weeks right after it pops up on the forums. But we, we take all that into account. I mean, we really want to focus on what's the best, the best player experience for everything that we do. So League of Legends, how many people played League of Legends? Most everybody on it. So I don't need to go into everything about League of Legends. This thing keeps like auto moving. It's possessed. Two seconds. Let me try it another way. I'm going to do it in rehearsal mode. And then that should reset the uh, slides for some reason. All right, sorry about that. So um, this is a scale talk. So it's useful in a scale talk to have uh, some perspective on what we're talking about in terms of scale. So we released some numbers in July of last year and basically covered that we had 15 million registered users. Uh, we had about 4 million uh, players a month and a peak CCU of about 500,000 uh, players a day when we hit peak. Now, if we compare that to November, going forward just a little bit, uh, we went to 32 million registered accounts, uh, 4.2 million daily players, and 1.3 million uh, peak concurrent users. So a little bit of a difference. Now, if any of you went to, how many of you went to Travis George's talk this morning on Dominion? Uh, one of the phrases that Travis used was riot scale. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about the things we do at Riot Games is those are the numbers that you have to hit when something goes out the door. And not only do you have to hit those numbers, but you have to plan in advance. Case in point, a feature that went out in July now needs to be able to handle a much larger amount of users in November, for instance. So for you know, certain types of features, you know, Dominion... Um, I think it was about 12 months worth of development. So obviously, we can't go rework Dominion between July and November to hit scale targets. So we have to be cognizant of that as we're developing new features to kind of have runway going forward. 
Now, you, t you take the scale and you take the mission of being the most player-focused uh, player gaming company in the world, and then you start to look at that in terms of challenges. And the big thing is there's lots of ways that we can solve problems, but they don't always make sense from a player perspective. So social elements, for instance, they have to be accessible from everybody. It doesn't make sense if five of you can chat with five more people, but you can't chat with everybody in PvP Net, for instance. Um, there's also crafting just an enjoyable player experience. So one of the things we like to get right is when we release a feature, we like for everybody to be able to get their hands on it. Um, how many people have ever gotten a, a Christmas gift and you pick the box up and it kind of feels funny and you open it up and there's some, uh, dot, there's some inkjet printer uh, printed out thing from Amazon that says, you will receive this in two weeks. Your mom you know, didn't order it on time or something, so you got this stop gap. Well, how many people like that? It sucks. So it's the same thing, you know, with gaming. You don't want, I mean, we don't want to have this feature out and like, oh, well, only a thousand people can play it right now or something. That's not what you want to do. And, just, you know, just like the Christmas gift, you'd almost wish that you didn't get the Christmas gift because now you just got to stare at this piece of paper and you're like, this isn't fun. Well, I mean, it's the same thing when we release features. I mean, if everyone can't play them, it's just not fun. I mean, it, it actually does the inverse. It creates negative, you know, will of the player base and people just aren't enjoying what they're doing. So when something goes out the door, we like to make sure that everybody can get it. Uh, you know, the more recent example, for instance, uh, was ranked teams, and then back before that um, with Dominion. Dominion was in private, uh, was in uh, limited beta form for uh, a couple days, and then flash forward to Monday, and here's Dominion, and it, everybody can go play it. So how do we create a system that balances this? We've got scale that continues to increase, but yet we want to deliver, you know, the highest quality all at the same time to the players. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Essentially, what, we've, what I've tried to do is, over the last four years, we develop a number of core strategies that have kind of evolved that we use to align uh, with player value and being able to run League of Legends as an operational service. And I've tried to take the core things that we do and really get down to the essence of them. So it's not just me talking about, well, yeah, we did this cool thing, we wrote these lines of code, and here we go. You guys can't do anything with that. So we're going to start with the core items, and then we're going to work back and add some, color, add some color commentary of how that applies to League of Legends. But at the end of the day, whether you've got a big project or a small project, if it's mobile or if it's you know, a, a PC game, all the things that we're talking about should apply. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about embracing Java and NoSQL, although really most of this is NoSQL, so if you don't use Java, it's not a, not a big deal. We're going to talk about how we think simple is the best way to go, followed up by coding a dynamic system, some scaling best practices, and then finally, monitoring everything. So, embracing Java and NoSQL. So the first thing, the problem that we have is, how do we develop a system rapidly, but at the same time, plan for future capacity needs, just like we saw with those slides a second ago. July is here, November is here. Um, a little bit of context as we're going through uh, the session this afternoon. The backend platform systems for League of Legends are, are written in a, a Java-based stack. So we use a lot of different technologies at Riot. Uh, you know, we use Adobe Flex, we use PHP, we've got a lot of C++ code. But we're going to kind of focus on this portion of the stack today that does a lot of the backend systems with matchmaking, uh, game server allocation, things of that nature. As far as what the stack looks like in a little more detail, uh, we use a kind of a mix of old and new elements. If you've done anything in the Java ecosystem, Spring and Tomcat are pretty uh, common things in that space. And then we use a caching technology uh, from Oracle called Oracle Coherence. So before I dive into NoSQL, when we were developing League of Legends, well, I couldn't tell you that we would be where we're at today in terms of CCU or players. We did always have an eye towards the future. And part of building something is not just building it, it's being able to sustain it and grow it. So given that, you know, we wanted to be able to continue to develop faster and faster. So we use a lot of open source. Uh, you can do that with any language, whether it's in Python or in Ruby. Big thing is tooling. Um, technologies almost always fail my five-minute test because of tooling. You pull something up in an IDE or some you know, editor that's supposed to support a language, and then it doesn't work. Or you try to run the debugger, or you try to run a profiler. So you know, there are languages that are more concise, but um, that's not the entire part of the delivery pipeline. 
you have to be able to debug things, you have to be able to performance tune, and if you don't have the right tools to be able to do that, then you run into problems. So we always try to take both tools and language into account when we're delivering features at Riot. We also looked at the fact that we had a large pool of developers to pull from. There are a lot of buzzword-centric technologies right now that are awesome technologies, but you can't hire anybody to do anything with them. You'll find one guy, and the other two guys got a job somewhere else. So that's also a problem. So one of the things we liked about Java is there's a, a, a large talent pool of really awesome developers that we can work with to continue to raise the bar of our engineering teams. As I mentioned earlier, we use a product from Oracle called Oracle Coherence, but I like to always explain it. If you took the name off of it and threw the source code up on GitHub, it would just be classified as a NoSQL. Oh, PowerPoint says no. That's good. I blame the projector. I think I can just skip ahead. Yeah. There we go. Okay, try this again. So if you put it up on GitHub, uh, it would just be classified as a NoSQL technology. The other thing is uh, we were, you know, when we started development of League of Legends four years ago, the you know the NoSQL space was different than it is today. So we we do use different NoSQL technologies at Riot today. We use uh, Redis for some things, MongoDB. But back when we were making decisions four years ago to to start with, this was one of the more established choices. Uh, Coherence is used a lot in the financial space. So there's a there's a lot of large clusters um, that do a lot of high performance computing behind it. So the big things that coherence gives us, and you get these with a lot of NoSQL technologies, you get horizontal scaling. Um, that's helped us simplify absorbing CCU growth over time. So you can add boxes, the data partitions. So that, that, that's a pretty good combination. The other thing that you get from a lot of NoSQL technologies, and we talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, it's not just about the tech. A lot of them have patterns of the way you interact with them. And given those patterns, the real power is what they're you know, enforcing with those patterns that then translates out in scale and other benefits later. So, and I started this with the presentation view again. One more time. Sorry about that, guys. It is possessed today. Okay. So... As far as how we use coherence, one way that people use caching technologies, how many people use memcache? So a lot of times with memcache, we'll do a cache to the side pattern where you have some sort of data access tier, and then you load data from a database, and then we turn around and uh, put the data in the cache to then read from memory. And normally it's some sort of distributed memory uh, for, because you have too much data or something. It's not going to fit on a local machine. Well, in our case... We actually take the cache and pull it over here, and it's actually the first level that the uh, DAO talks to. In a lot of cases, I tell the engineers, just forget that there's a database even back there. So the benefit of that is it's much more direct on one, at one level, but then we're also taking advantage of all the different technologies that are in the, the NoSQL and slash caching layer itself. Uh, a lot of times, to get real performant things, you're going to have to get down into the technology. The idea of we're going to do everything agnostic it starts to kind of break down at some point because you need something that you're just not going to get in an agnostic sense. Just like if you've written SQL and then you need to get down to some stored procedure technology in Postgres or MySQL, you can't write it in plain vanilla a lot of times. So we get a lot of power from doing that, though. The biggest thing um, is, is grid computing. Uh, I can write one line of code and run a query or run a mutation operation and it will turn around and use 200 cores seamlessly and come back with some sort of result. I don't have to worry about, well, will it not come back? What if it gets duplicate um, data coming back? It's just one line of code, and that's it. That's a really cool thing, because now engineers at Riot, we don't have to focus on, well, how do I deal with all the plumbing of 200 cores? I just use them. So I can go back and do what I want to do, which is focus on player value. 
We also get things, as I mentioned earlier, like transparent partitioning. So we can add machines to the cluster and our scale pretty much goes out linearly in a very predictable fashion. So moving a little bit away from the setup now, uh, the next thing is simple is best. So how do we develop features quickly, but at the same time don't drown ourselves in bugs and technical debt? So a modern CPU will do more than 3 billion instructions. That's a lot. Uh, you can throw away and mess around with 2.5 billion instructions and still have 500 million instructions to do something with. Uh, most code I've seen, 500 million instructions is plenty for most types of things that you're doing. The other thing is technology these days is fast. I'm not saying you don't need to pay attention to it and you know make smart decisions, but languages are fast, memory's fast, network's fast. Uh, used to, when I was fresh out of college, you'd have all these debates about this language is fast, this language is slow, this is interpreted, you can never use it for that. I don't hear a lot of that these days. You know, if you read Hacker News, most of the stuff is not about a language being fast or slow. I mean, there's all kinds of things with, you know, uh, JavaScript with Node.js out there and Python and all kinds of new languages. So it's really not so much about, you know, raw language speed anymore. The other thing is complexity at the end of the day is the enemy of quality. Um, the more complex things are, I can give you a laundry list of reasons why that's a problem. Uh, you know, long methods with lots of code in them. If you try to transition it to a new engineer, you know, that, that handoff has problems. You know, there's unforeseen edge cases. There's bugs that pop up. If you want to reuse code between this piece of a system over here and this piece of a system over there, it doesn't quite fit right because it's too big. So at the end of the day, our big thing is to not over-design. So let's, let's dig into a little bit of that. So one of the theories that we use is this thing, what we call rig the game. So you can have some sort of operation that you need to do multiple things at the same time. And you can do a lot of coordination, but it's usually easier to kind of divide the inputs up in advance if you can kind of flip the problem inside out. So if we look at a visualization of that, you can have a bunch of threads and have work and then have data that they share, and they can sit there and coordinate. But as you can see, just looking at this picture, the picture doesn't even look clean. You got all these lines, it kind of takes you a second to figure out what's going on. On the flip side, you can take the data, kind of nightly, nicely split it up based on pairing it up with the work. It's a much cleaner picture. The other thing is the code behind this is much simpler. Once the code gets a chunk of data, it does what it needs to do, and that's it. It doesn't have to worry about edge cases. It doesn't have to worry about dirty reads or anything else. It just goes about its business. And then that pattern will pretty much stack out. So a couple examples of that in League of Legends. Uh, right around season one, we went through and reworked the game server allocation algorithm. Um, and I'll talk more about that later as well. But one of the things that we did was we wrote it with the idea that it can partition itself. And for the longest time in production, we never turned it up more than one. There was just, you know, a, a level one running back there. But then when we got close to Dominion, if you went to Travis's presentation, one of the interesting characteristics of Dominion was the fact that games are now 20 minutes shorter for Dominion. So if the same quantity of players that used to play Summoner's Rift now play Dominion, it's twice as many people going through the turnstiles. So uh, twice as many game starts twice as many champ selects, twice as many statistics being processed, twice as many games being allocated. So when we were load testing for Dominion, we went and cranked the knob up, so to speak, validated the results, tweaked a couple of little edge cases for things. Um, you can run into things like uh, starvation with this model. I mean, you don't want to run out of game servers, for instance. So we added a little bit of work stealing. So uh, you didn't have one pool that got full and the other one didn't. But all in all, it was a very simple migration. So the next thing I'm going to cover today is the concept of coding a dynamic system. And this is one of the key things that we've evolved to do at Riot over, over the last uh, several years. So the, the big problem is how do we handle not only monthly change, but uh, as you guys all know, every two weeks we push out a champion and use a couple skins. So we have biweekly change. And then we also have what I like to call hourly change. Change is not just when we decide that we're going to have change. Change just kind of happens. So I usually like to use the analogy, a single box or a developer uh, laptop or workstation is a very predictable beast. It's got a set amount of memory, there's a set CPU on it, you run your code, it runs kind of in a predictable amount of time, and you know what you're going to get. 
A large system, however, changes while it's running. Um, I, like, I usually say around the office, I mean, it's, it's basically organic. There's inputs and outputs, and you see things ripple, but at the same time, you may not exactly know, well, why does that ripple? I, I see it, and I kind of know, but again, why is it doing that? And there's all kinds of reasons for that. So a couple examples just to give you guys a few uh, that we've seen over the years. Uh, one thing, I think it was two summers ago, um, we had lots of player reports on the forums of issues in the game, and we kind of dug into our systems a little bit, and then it kind of went away. Well, then late in the day, we figured out, this happened to be uh, Europe, the, uh, there was, a, I think, a Champions League uh, playoff going on, and all the people in Europe were streaming the soccer matches over the Internet, and the pipes were just a little bit full. So we were seeing a reflection, essentially, of the, of the Internet infrastructure in Europe, and it wasn't just us. All kinds of other games were seeing it, too. So that was something that didn't have anything to do with us doing a deploy, yet we had an operational you know, change that we had to try to mitigate. Um, a little different example that I'll tell on myself is back when we were in a real, real early beta. Um, of course, we were a 25, 30 person company, and our beta environment was sharing a certain amount of infrastructure and data centers that our load test environment was sharing. And I'm sitting in the office in Santa Monica. I got my headphones on. I'm pounding the heck out of the system trying to, you know, raise the scale on some stuff. And all of a sudden, everybody around me starts asking, well, why do we have lag in the system? What's going on here? And the forums go crazy. I'm like, it's probably me. So I clicked the little button, stopped the load test, and sure enough, everything went away. Well, it turns out I had saturated a couple of switches and a few other things sitting there in the office with my little... Uh, botnet of load test harnesses. So, you know, that was another example of something that just kind of came out of the left field. But there's much more practical things, too. I mean, you, you get hardware failures. If you do the math on large systems, you know, a hard drive will die, you know, once, about once a year on average. So if you have enough boxes, you're going to get a hard drive that dies every day. So the question is, when do we fix this? Uh, do we do it next release? Do we, do we create a downtime? Well, if we do it next release, what if it's a big problem? Again, player value. Another one would be, what if we do it during a downtime? Well, we can pick lighter downtimes, but that doesn't mean there's not people playing. Um, for instance, we hired a new engineer the, the other day, and we were talking, and he's got a young son, so he gets up at 5 in the morning and would play League of Legends, uh, get a couple games in in the morning. Well, we might be doing downtime at 5 a.m. Pacific. So, yeah, that doesn't affect the masses, but he's just as valuable as they are. So... You know, you want to try to not have downtime as well when you have to fix things. So that's not going to work. So there's a variety of ways that we come about making things dynamic. Uh, one of them is picking technologies with elastic properties. Um, as we talked about earlier with, like, NoSQL. You get dynamic cluster uh, recomposition if you need to pull nodes. We try to pick a lot of things with stateless growth patterns so we can add boxes in and, you know, put them behind the load balancer and add capacity, things of that nature. Now, not everything has to be elastic. A lot of times you'll get force multipliers. So like, for instance, in our caching tier, that helps a lot of things. You know, it's less load on things in the front. They can kind of spread out across the caching tier. You also get things in different places in the stack, maybe sometimes behind the, the caching tier. So like in our case, we do uh, right behind uh, batching for certain things. So that actually gives us, in some ways, uh, a little more robustness for the database, because the database doesn't have to work as hard. There's not as many simultaneous open connections. Uh, you know, being able to take a larger chunk of data, the databases can optimize a little different. So, you know, compared to what I've seen on a lot of crazy rigs and setups with, you know, 50, 100 MySQL instances, we don't have to run near as much per CCU as what I've seen for a lot of things that just go straight to a database, for example. Now, it, it's also not just about technologies. It's about what you do with your code. Your code is probably the biggest thing um, that you're going to run into, is things that you've done. And we've done lots of these our, ourselves. Uh, I'm not going to lie, when we first rolled League of Legends out, guess what we did? We had properties and config files. Because that's what everybody else does. They've got their little XML or their JSON or their text file, and hey, that works. Works real good until the system is having an issue at 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon, and you don't want to have to reboot it to, to change a setting. So all of our settings are dynamic these days. And then we use uh, coherence to basically propagate out the data. 
but you can use all kinds of different things. Um, I think uh, Netflix the other day did a white paper or something I th that I saw that they're using Zookeeper to push out configuration changes. Now, the other thing that people get hung up on is, well, oh, when do I push those changes? How do I make this happen? Because you know, I need to make sure it happens at right this exact second. Well, with a larger running system or just any system in general, there is no exact second. There's people, and there's still people. So there's just before and after. So it doesn't matter that you get lost in the minutia of it has to go out right here. It's just before and after, and it needs to be a reasonable amount of time. The other thing is your algorithms have to be able to take uh, advantage of this. You can push out a new setting, but if your system doesn't ever pay attention to it, it doesn't matter. So a lot of our algorithms, essentially, you know, they'll, they'll loop or they'll come back around and every so often look and see, oh, well, this value went from 5 to 10. Let me adjust. So looking at some more specific examples of this, um, all the thread pools that we've got, we've added wrappers to them to be able to config them on the fly. Uh, let's just say it's not a good thing if we have a box that's running at 10% CPU and we have some operational issue and uh, Mark Merrill's like, well, can we fix it? And I'm like, well, we have lots of hardware, but no, I can't get any more threads out of it right now. I mean, that's just silly. So all the threads we can, we can tweak on the fly if we need to. We've taken this up a couple levels in recent years as well. Uh, we can change roles in machines, you know, pull them in and out. This helps a lot with uh, hot fixes. We, we can do you know, much smaller hot fixes on back end server side things now. And we can also do different things with features uh, without just rolling them out as part of a big bang deploy. So Dominion, again, was a perfect example of that. Dominion was out. We were able to do some kind of uh, real world uh, beta testing with it and then just flip it on. So that works out really good to be able to manage that. So the next thing I'm going to dive into is scaling best practices. So what happens when we follow all these rules for scaling that we see floating around the internet and we still run into issues? So this is my modern scaling cliff notes, as I like to call it, when we do uh, engineering onboarding in, in, uh, at Riot. So we start out, and scaling is hard. So let's get rid of some things so it's easier. What do we get rid of? Anybody know? There's like all kinds of options. And then there's these things that you use all the time. You're like, I can't get rid of that. So then we go the other way. We're like, well, all right, I'll start with a blank sheet of paper. And we're going to just put like three things on there and call it a day. And then once we only have three things, we can optimize. So let's say we make a choice that the minimum user that plays League of Legends has to have a two megabit internet connection. Well, I don't have to optimize for a 56K modem anymore, as an example. There might be some other decisions I can make. You know, maybe my art assets can be a little bit bigger because I know they can come down faster. So if we take that and we take the, that concept and we look at it with some different technologies, how many people know what MapReduce is? So a lot of the Hadoop stuff in the BI space these days, it's, it's a concept called MapReduce under the hood. And really, MapReduce is saying, well, we're going to solve all of our problems with a map step and a reduce step. And then we can optimize the heck out of how that operates. Uh, with NoSQL, a lot of NoSQL is, I'm going to just take your joins away. Because the average case is awesome on your joins, but the unaverage case that we need to join two big tables causes you performance problems. So if you don't do that most of the time, you won't have problems. Now, interestingly enough, most NoSQL technologies are putting joins back, and secondary indexes, and NoSQL. I mean, SQL now, it's kind of funny. Uh, another one's Cap Theorem. How many people know what Cap Theorem is? So CAP theorem is this theory that says you've got uh, consistency, availability, and uh, partitioning. And you can only pick two. So if you want consistency and availability, it's kind of hard to partition stuff. Whereas if you have availability and you can seamlessly partition, keeping things completely consistent all the time will cause problems. So looking at this at a little more practical level, the common example if you read a lot of big data stuff or uh, scaling data in general is they talk about keeping stuff together. So they usually always use this example of like a blog entry. And the blog entry has a comment. You can store them in the same record. Then you do something. Uh, I write some crazy uh, you know, discussion on, um, on the League of Legends forums uh, with a blog, one of our blogs about something about this champion is the best champion ever. Well, everybody gets on there and says, no, you're crazy. So now I have 300 comments that are all stored in the same record. And now my operator my code that's manipulating that has a different performance characteristic. 
But we're not here to talk about blog comments. So let's talk about a very practical example of the same thing. So with League of Legends, we have servers that run lots of uh, League of Legends server processes. And we have a root object that, we, that represents the server. And there's a bunch of child objects that represent the game server processes underneath that. And we use that as part of our uh, game server provisioning algorithm. So the thing that's interesting is, over time, the complexity of those child objects has gotten uh, larger. We have more game modes now. There's more champions in the game. And the number of games per server, we're more efficient, and we run larger hardware than we used to. So if you kind of dig down into the data model a little more, you've got a machine. It might have game instances with name and player and some different state. Well, the problem is, all that's happening at the same time, and these child objects start to get bigger. And I've got tons of instances on a, on a server. So I go from pushing 20K of data around to maybe pushing more than a half a meg of data around. And even though I said things are fast, things aren't infinitely fast. So I start having network transfer and object serialization being bounding factors to my game server provisioning algorithm. You've also got the fact that this algorithm performs exactly the opposite of how you would want as an engineer. As you get more people on the system, it goes slower. At a minimum, you want it to run at constant speed. And even better, it would be to find a clever way with uh, technologies that use like ring buffers to actually run faster when there's more load on it. But we're going the opposite. So essentially, we've kind of got the pipe full. I mean, yeah, we may not be saturating a one gig uh, you know, uh, network segment, but we're still bound by moving all that data around. So at this point, we had to go back uh, before season one and review and basically say, do we really have one object anymore? We thought we did. But when we really dug into it, there's actually, even though it's, it, both objects are about a game, they have very different roles. So we had to go through and divide those objects up uh, with one having the players in some different state that we need for pregame and another object that represents just the state we need for game server allocation. At that point, that object became a very consistent fixed size. So now the pipe is much better. So the game server provisioning algorithm will now run uh, pretty much at constant speed. So essentially, the moral of the story is all these rules, you can't just let them go to your head. You gotta wonder, well, okay, when do I pick a new set of rules? When do I slightly adjust things? And you, you have to continue to look at your system as it evolves to see if now you've moved into a different place that now you need to react to. So the final thing I wanna drive into is the concept of monitoring everything. So how do we know when we have a problem? We've got pictures. How many people like pictures? A few people. All right. How many people like logs with millions of operations a day? A few more people. It's about even so far. Well, I'm going to vote like this. There are logs right now that I will die before I can scan them with my eyes enough to find patterns in them. I've tried. And there's also causality. Causality in logs is hard. You can, you know, a lot of times limit things down by a thread, but when you're going across different machines, you've got to start having, uh, you know, ways to coordinate, you know, transactions and sequences, and it just kind of spirals out of control real quick. So, like, in this case, uh, this happened to be a network issue, and we can see it ripple through that organic system I talked about earlier with load averages change, and the matchmaking queue has uh, a little hiccup, and then the, you can see it reflect in the network traffic. So... You go look at the graphs, and you, essentially you can try to go back in time and figure out, well, what was the trigger? Because you'll see the ripple in all kinds of different cases. Maybe it was the other thing. Maybe it was the matchmaking queue. Well, if there's an issue with the matchmaking queue, then people can't get in champ select as fast, and you'll see network ramifications that way. So it is kind of tricky to find the timing, but at least you've got something to start with. So we try to monitor the heck out of everything. Uh, and one way that we do that is we automate metrics gathering. So in our case with Java, we've got an um, uh, AOP uh, aspect-oriented interceptor that basically we log all the external calls for League of Legends uh, coming into the, pl the platform systems. So think about that for a second. Lots of calls. Then we sample the internal calls. Now, really, we just need a statistical sample. So we've backed this uh, out over time. It used to be, I don't know, 5% and 1%. Now it's probably a tenth of a percent. And then we, we log all that out, and then we automate the reporting on it. And as the last bullet point says, people always like ask me, well, isn't this slow? 
Well, you need, you know, you need to be cognizant of things. You know, you don't want to get a disk I/O backup or something like that. So you, you've got to make sure that that's okay. But general overhead on this CPU and disk wise is about one percent, versus the data that allows us to triage live systems and you know make evaluations of changing features. That data is invaluable. Now, all that data is useless if I can't look at it in a good way. So this happens to be an uh, example of an automated report that we run that basically compares two snapshots in time, and it runs every day on all the different uh, environments that we run. Now, I can scan those numbers that are there, but that's going to take me a second. So as you can see, we've got the color-coded red bars that pop out real quick, and I can say, well, something's changed. So now, what are we going to do next? We've got those red bars. What, how are we going to dig into that problem? We could go back to our logs and grep things. That sounds like a good idea. However, if you're going to bother to add one layer of automation, why stop there? So it was very obvious when we first got this report. The engineer that worked on it, he'd, bring, he'd email me the sample of it, and I'd be like, great. Now, what are we going to do with the red bar? And I'd always ask him the, the next question was always the same one. So I'm like, well, let's just automate that. So in this case, let's say hypothetically the red bar was like a, a max value. So with a max value, I'm going to want to know distribution because a max is only telling me a ha half the problem. So in this case, you can, you know, very, I don't know if you guys can read that or not, but down at the bottom, we've got about 113 calls that took more than two seconds. Uh, that could have been a slow ISP, all kinds of things. But on the flip side, I've got a little bit north of uh, uh, 542,000 that are less than 100 milliseconds. So if I was to give you a percentage on this, 99.99 something percent are all fine. So statistically, there's really not a problem here. So we need to go through and automate to make those decisions be able to just happen. Um, now, some other things that we've done is uh, game server monitoring. You know, originally there's things that dump out in logs that say uh, how many people have been in uh, Champ Select, and then we transition and you sit there and wait that usually is indicative of a game server having issues. So we'll turn around and we've automated the log gathering of that and it goes straight to the person that's going to react to that. Um, and then over time, we've, we've worked, started to work on things like building more sophisticated rules that the servers will basically just take themselves offline. I mean, again, it's easier to err on the side of the player experience than it is to you know, wake somebody up or have the network operations center take the time to go figure it, go respond. It's better to pull the thing from service, you know, in a, you know, my, in a uh, peaceful transition and then react to the problem. So to recap, we talked a little bit about embracing technologies that are elastic, like NoSQL. Uh, we're big believers at Riot that the best thing to do is usually the simplest thing to do. Um, the engineers that sit at the round table and say, oh, I need this crazy threading thing, and I need this big, huge you know, grid computing setup. A lot of times, we don't even need that, even though we use it. Uh, we use it for some things, but we try not to, to pound a fit and put everything in it. We always start with simple. A dynamic system is going to give you a lot more operational flexibility than having hard-coded config files and things that are very rigid. Monitoring everything, or excuse me, scaling best practices it, uh, are pretty much, you know, even though they're the 80-20 case, there are cases that they are meant to be broken. And then finally, you need to monitor the live system, otherwise you essentially are kind of flying blind in terms of uh, what is actually happening and what's happening to your players. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, I purposely left a little bit of time because I assume people had a number of questions. Just walk up to the mics. If you want to talk to anybody at Riot, there's a few people floating around the audience. Uh, I'll be available afterward. And then we've got a booth at the, uh, over in the Career Pavilion. If you're interested in any of the types of things that we're doing, we're always looking for uh, more awesome engineers to join Riot Games. So thank you. Uh, question on uh, your server side stuff sure. how, do you, how do you test everything how do you test you know things like failover or if somebody accidentally a server you know you can't just crash a data center and nope. see what happens so well actually <laughs> uh, one of the things oh, that we God do that, <laughs> that I've heard is a little different than some people is we have a couple full-scale environments 
that we try to test as detailed as we can. Uh, there are certain features. It takes longer to statistically model the data, dummy it up, and run the, uh, I like to call it, it's like the, uh, the um, high school chemistry lab experiments. It takes longer to do that sometimes than uh, to actually write the code sometimes. We do a lot of that. Um, now, I, that's not, uh, even for us, that's not always practical for everything. So we try to spend a lot of time of what can I do to test something that will then extrapolate. Um, so that's another thing that we do. Uh, as far as specifically your case of failure, 95% um, of things that I've seen that has a white paper or a sales guy that says it fails over doesn't. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen something that, oh yeah, it's master slave, and when you pull the master, it's just going to pop. It never works like that. I can give you two technologies we've got in our stack that work as advertised, and the rest we've had to kind of work on. So, yeah, you have to test failover. You don't just put it in and configure it and go. Um, I know some companies, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it's Netflix has got a, con a, a tool called Chaos Monkey that they actually let it run during set hours of the day, and it just runs around and destroys stuff. <laughs> Because their theory is if you can't survive when something's destroyed, then you're, not, you're kind of just putting your head in the sand. Uh, I know I joke with some of the guys at Riot. I'll say things have been running good, and they're like, shh. I'm like, no. I want a system good enough that I can taunt it daily, and it still won't fall over. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things we do. But, yeah, the big thing is to test the failover cases because they don't ever work out of the box. So, yeah. As far as monitoring everything, uh, a couple of charts up there look like you uh, use a tool called Cacti. Is that true? And do you we've also used, use any others? We've used Cacti for some things. Um, we use, you know, Nagios for different alerting. One of the more recent things is we ended up writing a homegrown charting tool for a lot of the non-hardware type metrics that are actually, um, I'd call them synthetic metrics of our application. And essentially what we've done is we, we're big on the definition of done at Riot. And it's not just code. You know, it's unit test. It's QA. Well, one of the definitions of done these days at Riot is every piece of code, every feature that goes out, you have to be able to monitor it at an application level. So developers, you know, we've got libraries. They'll drop a couple lines of code in for their key metrics. And then when the features go out, we make sure to explain to, you know, the network operations staff and to, you know, live support and player support, different people that will be consuming that data, what does it mean? So it's not just the engineers. So it's part of the development cycle. You have to have data. Because what we kept running into was we'd write things and then they'd go to production and then we'd be like, oh, it'd be nice if we added an alert for that. Or it'd be nice if we had data for that. And we, you were just too far behind, you were just too much behind the curve when you, you did it that way. So we've got some homegrown tools for some of those things. Now, there are, there's a ton of things these days that, you know, you can just pull off the shelf. There's three or four different things on GitHub. Uh, I know um, uh, StumbleUpon had a, a time series based uh, tool that's backed by Hadoop, and you can basically store, like, finite data, like CPUs and all kinds of different things, uh, and basically you don't have to get rid of any of it, which is really nice, because if you need to go back to an event and you correlate it from two weeks ago, you don't just have the aggregate. You can get down to the, the, the detail level data. So um, I'd look at some of that stuff if it's something you're interested in. So. Thanks. Let's see. Hi, um, I was just kind of wondering because you did a great job of uh, explaining scaling on technology, but I'm also kind of interested in how the human resources end of this works because if you're scaling technology, I assume you need a certain amount of human resources to be able to cope with, uh, you know, a building out of your systems because, I mean, you've already described a lot of QA and testing yeah. and, and, and programming. So can you describe a little bit of how... Uh, how much? How big is your team, and what do you think you need to actually implement some of these techniques, and what, maybe some other advice in that area? Um, as far as exact numbers these days, uh, I'll apologize. I'm probably not the guy, um, but I can give you a couple ballparks. Um, first of all, we got a 24-hour day uh, network operations staff. That there's usually two or three guys. Uh, basically on duty all the time. So that's just the live side of it. Now, I think back to what you were maybe hitting on. One of the things that we invested in uh, several years ago, because we knew it was going to come to pass, uh, is uh, DevOps. So we have an in-house DevOps tool that basically, just like the definition of done is you have to be able to monitor things, the other definition of done is you have to have the recipes to be able to push the code. So that scales all the way up from you know local QA environments to larger public you know public beta environments to you know different platforms of League of Legends all over the world. So that's actually kept you know the the people side of this uh, much more uh, fixed than what it would have been otherwise. Uh, you know as we've grown because we have different territories that uh, run as different environments instead of having to have you know a whole set of people for each one. 
the tool will do a lot of it, and we keep you know trying to automate that as much as possible. So really, you need people more on you know the things with you know racking and stacking hardware and that side of it. So. But can you give me an overall staff? I tell, you, I tell you what, um, if you want to hang around after uh, the session, there's a couple people from Riot in the audience. I'll be happy to hook you up with, and they can give you uh, a more specific uh, number on some of that. Okay, so. I was just looking for ballpark. That's thank you. So. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering about your use of MapReduce, map because um, I guess um, some things, for example, getting one player stats, you don't really need MapReduce. I guess it's just like one get. So I was wondering what kind of situations you use MapReduce. A lot of the stuff we're driving on with MapReduce these days are uh, we have a, a big data team at Riot that is diving into a, a number of different things with um, statistics and BI and things of that nature. So. We're diving into a lot of uh, that stuff uh, with uh, Hadoop and MapReduce these days. Actually, it's a pretty hot thing that we're hiring for if you get any interest in it. But that's where a lot of it's coming from. On the, I, I call it the, the more pure platform side of the world, um, we haven't steered to that as much. I mean, three, four years ago, a lot of the MapReduce stuff was more batch job type things, which didn't really fit with a gameplay type experience. So, although there's different things now with you know that are more performant with stuff like that, but back when we were looking at some of the original stuff, we tried to probably keep the map produce a little more on the analytics side than the actual you know shape and select side of the house. So, cool, thanks. Yeah, can you talk about how and how often you guys do your load testing? Load testing is a continual thing, as I like to say, but uh, primarily there's uh, load testing that fits in the cadence of the release um, that goes out every two weeks, so that's a must. Um, essentially, there's a what I it, it's similar to the uh, tribunal for the game. There's a load testing tribunal, and they have to sign off on things. And if uh, they don't, then various people start to kind of, what's going on? Is it, how's the release? Is it ready to go? Now that being said, we also use load testing for uh, a number of features because sometimes, uh, as we like to call it, there, we have this concept that we call it the treadmill. So when code goes in, and depending on where it gets, then you know you have a set amount of time for it's going to go out. So we'll actually branch off and do specific load tests for different things uh, to verify uh, you know, different uh, code paths and strategies before the code goes into main. Uh, because sometimes just based on the risk factors of it and things like that, you have to have the data before you can just say, all right, this is ready to go out the door now. So. Yeah. Hey, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I was curious in your perspective on the value of owning your own hardware and the data centers and that sort of thing, especially as it relates to scalability. And you know, not so much when you're like where you are now at whatever, 30 million monthly active or 11 million monthly actives, but as you're building your enterprise early on and the cost benefit is, is less obvious than it is now. Yeah, it, you know, it's a mix of cost and performance and uh, predictability, I guess I'd say. Um, I, I've seen lots of things that I've spent an hour digging on something and then it's like, oh, Amazon's just having a bad day. Um, so, you know, it's a mix of things, you know, especially when you're starting out, uh, you know, there's a variety of cloud providers. I know I walked through the pavilion earlier, and there's uh, three or four of them over there that, you know, uh, are good places to probably start. The bigger thing I'd probably look at is, you know, where are you at with cons consistent performance? I mean, we've had the, uh, I'm trying to think, was that last fall when, the, when Amazon had, like, the big massive outage? And, you know, people were running from EBS volumes, you know, running for the hills and all kinds of stuff. So it, it adds a layer of... Um, disruption in just you know your performance too, and if the system can handle that, that's great. But it's not going to be quite as consistent as um, you know real hardware. So you know it, it's just a, it's a balance you got to maintain on all those things. Or the other thing you can do is you can have hybridized approaches. I've talked to a lot of uh, different people that you know you use a little bit of this, you use that for burst capacity, and so on and so forth. So yeah, hey Scott, thanks. Um, managing all those servers. <laughs> you know, for something this big, it's pretty tough, I'm sure. Uh, do you guys use any, like, uh, configuration management, like uh, Puppet or Chef? And, and, and how would you um, get those on the new instances as they're booting up, you know, if there's failover or you need a scale? Um, and how would you promote those from, like, dev to QA to prod once they're tested? Gotcha. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on the uh, DevOps side of things, we do use a lot of Chef. Uh, that basically is a key part of our kind of homegrown DevOps tool. So that 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 handles a decent amount of that. As far as the hardware goes, while it is you know smoke tested and things like that, hardware doesn't go from Dev to QA. The software does more so. So we don't have to worry as much about that. Um, and then the big thing is just having these things being elastic because you can't put something in if the system's not made to handle it. 
things. I mean, that's been the big thing. Or even if you, you essentially, you've got to be able to 100% trust it. Um, we, um, back in you know years past, we've had things that are supposed to fail over. They work most of the time. Well, or you know you can hot you know deploy things and they'll work most of the time. But then there might be an issue. Well, what happens is you end up erring erring on the side of well we're not going to do hot deploy because we don't know what'll happen. Even if it's a one percent case, you just can't. So I mean essentially you've nullified the entire thing. It's just like we have a, a bad you know a, a player that has a network issue. One player can cause an issue with you know the entire champ select process. So you've got to get those types of hot swappable things rock solid so then you can start to use them as a foundation. And if there's any um, doubt at all, then essentially uh, most of the time you end up just not using them to be safe. So, yeah. Hi. Five um, minutes. Um, I'm okay. curious if you uh, evaluated any other languages for your server backend, uh, especially C Sharp or Erlang, and what your opinions on those are? Yeah, I mean, we're constantly looking at things. I mean, again, the industry continues to evolve. So we do have some things in-house uh, with Erlang. And a little bit of stuff with Scala that we've uh, that we've been doing recently, so we've got some things there. Uh, at the time, at least when we started things with the platform, we wanted to kind of uh, accelerate using a mix of different open source tools and other things. So that's kind of where we arrived at with Java. Plus, uh, some of the guys on the team had uh, experience in that to start with. But you know, as we build new pieces and modules and things, we're always kind of on the lookout for what's the best thing. And you know, there is no one way to do this. I mean, like I said. These days, it's not about this language being fast or something else. There's different characteristics, you know, with you know actor-based models and things like that that have pros and cons to them. And in certain, in some situations, you know, the, the pros are you know very powerful. So, uh, what is your personal opinion of Erlang? Of Erlang. Erlang, I've seen a lot of awesome stuff done in Erlang. You know, it's one of the things that if I had it to do over, and I knew a little more about it when we started. A few other things, it would have been a very powerful thing. Um, I know we've got a couple of engineers that are diving into some of the things with it. I know, uh, I think it was Facebook, there's a uh, PDF floating around. They built their chat system on top of Erlang as an example. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve, especially coming from some other places, but the power of being able to swap things in and out, and, you know, it'll do in-memory migrations on different things is really cool for, you know, these types of systems. So, Good, thanks. So. Yeah. So you had active MQ on one of your slides. I wonder if you could talk about messaging and how that fits in with... Scalability and monitoring? Um, I didn't dive into it, but messaging is one of those key uh, elements that always comes up when you're reading about you know, building scalable systems. You, you know, you've got concepts of messaging, uh, essentially you know, asynchronous behavior. Because asynchronous behavior is also going to allow your system to stretch. Now, you know, it can only stretch so far, but if you've got messages going back and forth, then you've got some variance on uh, as far as you know, how fast things have to move. If they get degraded by 10%, it's okay. Depending on how you have buffering and persistence set up, that can do some things for failover. So messaging, uh, you know, is a key piece of the equation. Um, there's different ways to do that, you know, too. I mean, some people go down to kind of a bare bones layer these days with the zero MQ. There's the Java technologies. Uh, more recently, I know, uh, I think it's uh, Kessel that uh, Twitter's, uh, Twitter's got, and uh, I think it's Kafka is the one that LinkedIn has that have different characteristics. So. Yeah, that's that's a key part of you know the space as well, depending on you know your use case. So. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, again, uh, please fill out the evaluations. They're going to email out uh, afterward, and I'd be happy to hang out up here and talk for a second if anybody's got any questions. Thanks. <laughs>